So thank you everyone for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transportation. And uh, now I'm going to talk about the concept of um, the generational project. Um, I guess related to the concept of the mega project, but mega project, I guess, is a statement of size and generational is uh, a statement of relative frequency, by which I mean... Um, of, of course, mega project. So, um, mega projects are defined relatively, and I have a blog post about this from six months ago, um, about how um, if you can build, let's call you Paris, average city. I mean, large city, but in terms of construction costs, Paris is pretty average. Um, if you're Paris, you can build small metro extensions, and it's not a big deal. You do it all the time. Um, so that is something that is not a, a me that's not a mega project. Um, it's also not generational because you do it all the time. Um, and um, something like uh, Grand Paris Express, two hundred kilometers of driverless metro built as a single multi-line project, that is generational, and that is um, it's literally not. It's not like they're planning to do it multiple times. So it's a one-time thing. So it's view. So it, so a lot of stuff hangs on it. Um, now. I'm making this definitional, I'm starting with definitions because I think it is important, especially important in the context of um, what happens in places that are very aggressive about construction. Um, let's call these places any Chinese city, but I'm actually gonna talk about the aggressive builder that I'm most familiar with, which is Istanbul. Istanbul, again, St Istanbul can build. Uh, Istanbul has one of the lowest construction costs in the world. Um, it might actually be the single lowest construction cost. Um, I don't know what to say or how to define large city, but it's lower construction cost than Italy. Um, I think at this point, much lower construction cost than Seoul, and I think lower construction cost than uh, Madrid and uh, and Lisbon. So um, they can build. Um, they build very aggressively. And this means that, uh, so the thing is, a lot of what they do is still a mega project. Um, building an entire metro line, I don't mean a short extension, I mean an entire line is a mega project. Um, it's just when you do it many times, it's not generational. Um, and that's gonna matter. And the, uh, or maybe uh, post-war Japan is an even better example, um, where, yeah, they did a Shinkansen, and maybe the first one was thought to be generational, but then they did an entire extension from Shinosaka to Fukuoka, and then they did the the, the, the Sun Yoshinkansen, and then they did the um, Tohoku Shinkansen. So, so it's a, a lot of mega projects built in short succession, um, or the El Javez in France. It's the same thing. Um, it's every. I mean, yeah, the first one maybe was thought of as generational, but so the original one, uh, Paris de Lyon, opens eighty three, and then. Atlantique, so that's from Paris only as far as, uh, as Le Mans and Tours, and then the rest is on upgraded legacy track. This opens, I think, 90. Um, and then this open. You know, instead of trying to memorize the entire uh, sequence of exactly which line in France opened one, let's look at the map. Uh, let's do uh, work conservation. Uh, so, um, yeah, so 83, 90, uh, 93, 94. So these are pretty significant lines. You can think of them as a mega project, but certainly in the 90s and 2000s when a lot of this was built, this was not thought of as generational. It was just the normal French expansion program um, and, and in the 2010s also, by which point they mostly ran out of steam, but they still could build to Bordeaux, to, uh, to Rennes, uh, to, uh, to to complete, complete the section to Strasbourg. Um, and so um, th these are mega, these are mega projects. These are studied these are studied as mega projects, but again, they were not generational. Um, so the expectation was that there would be more. Um, the kind of um, opposite, so something that's generational but not mega, um, Berlin. Ber can Berlin build? And this is why I keep saying it's a follow up for my last stream, and I am um, hover on this blog post. Um, if you're watching on Twitch, um, this blog post, and, and you watched my Twitch stream three days ago, 
you already know everything I said here because I literally vlogged that. If you're watching on YouTube, it's just the previous YouTube. And uh, so with this, um, the importance is that Berlin can build. The construction costs in Berlin are not unusual. Um, and um, the and the stuff that was built most recently, those who say U5, I don't think it was treated as a mega project, um, but um, or the current expansion. Um, but there is a little bit of a generational aspect to it in which people think, oh, we can't build very much, so we can only build a few lines, so it's going to take a lot of time, and there's going to be a lot of bullshit discussion. And this is something I want to highlight. And again, and again I highlight Berlin. Um, and Borners, before you came on stream, I highlight one of your on um, your your comment on this, um, because um, um, so I want to respond to your comment, and then um, does it generation mean once in a generation, but often it means that it takes a generation? Good question. Um, is the French declaration a uh, declaration d'utilité publique? I don't know. Um, the problem is that I study things that are pretty mega, um, and I understand that like mega is only an adjective in Esperanto. You know what I mean? Um, but um, so so I can't tell you whether they do this process for a three kilometer tramway extension. Um, and and the reason is that I don't study three kilometer tramway extensions. This is not because it's a silly subject to study three kilometer tramway extensions. It's a very important topic, I think. Um, in the same way that the uh, that in the United States, all the internal study of construction costs studies short sections of highway, um, ones that pass the initial impetus to build the interstate network, were not at all mega, and um, often mega projects and. I don't know what the opposite of a mega project, normal small project, um, have different uh, issues in the United States. Generally, their problems are more, are worse for mega projects, rail or roads that includes road tunnel, than for things that are not mega. Um, and um, how much should we from the debt markets versus taxes? That does not matter as long as the debt. Or the, the question is not whether you come from debt. It comes from it's what the debt. How do you pay the debt? Um, if you borrow money and expect to pay it out of future taxes, great. If you borrow money and expect to do some weird alternate funding scheme like tax increment financing, where you say, oh, uh, we'll do impact fees on new development in the area, or we'll just expect new development in the area to contribute more in property taxes, that's just going to be a disaster. Um, so um, it's essentially, if, essentially, if the funding does not come from a mechanism that offends the general public, like it, it offends the general public to increase their taxes, um, or to openly borrow more money, then you will have no cost control. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, so, so in Indonesia, I would not expect NIMBYs to be a significant problem, although, although, um, unless, I'm, unless Jakarta is doing something that nobody else in Southeast Asia does, um, there is a lot of preemptive surrender in that um, a lot of these projects in developing countries, uh, when the, so they're either elevated or underground, and the NIMBYs hate the Ls, but the NIMBYs um, would also hate cut and cover subways, and cut and cover subways are not generally built. Um, for example, you go to Singapore, Singapore, I don't know, Singapore is not a developing country, um, but in Singapore, it's a uh, uh, deep war. And I believe that the I believe in Bangkok, the uh, underground lines, the uh, MRT as opposed to the BTS, um, they're also deep board, um, as opposed to being shallow cut and cover, and that's just expensive. Um, so, yeah, you don't get NIMBYs in theory, but in practice, often there's a lot of preemptive surrender, often because the um, recommendations, and this is something that I know is true in Jakarta, and it's true all over Southeast Asia, again, to some extent, to some extent except Singapore, but Singapore privatized the state for a different reason. Um, there's a lot of kind of privatization of planning to um, um, international consultants, often Japanese ones, often Chinese ones, geopolitical often, and uh, they are designing based on their own uh, standards. And especially if they're Japanese, they're assuming they're basing them on Japanese standards of NIMBYism, which are 
uh, very difficult. So um, this also is where you get um, high-speed lines designed by Japan that are um, on viaducts rather than on much cheaper but more land-intensive earthworks. Um, this is a problem in, for example, India, or for that matter, in Texas. Um, I mean, if you do cut and cover, that just raises the question of why is it so expensive? Mm -hmm. Singapore is not a business. Singapore is a country. It's just a country that is run by people who think Maggie didn't, and Margaret Thatcher didn't go far enough. Um, but anyway, so the point of the point of a generation. So I want to go back to the first, like the concept of a generational project, um, and I'm going to actually for a moment not want to talk about the MRT in Jakarta, and the reason is that the MRT is a first line, and I want to specifically not talk about specifically not talk about the first line, um, because the first line, uh, because remember the definition of a generational project is not size. The definition of generational project is that it is perceived as a once in a generation opportunity um and um the first line might be the only line or it might be first of many and um at least in the sing in the first line cases that i know of um it was conceived as first of many um and, and, and I imagine that Jakarta wants to build many more MRT lines, and this is true, again, of the other South and Southeast Asian high-cost examples that I'm thinking of, like in the in both Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, yeah, there's the first line, but they're already building multiple lines. They don't expect this to be the only line, or in Manila, or in, or in Bangkok, um, or in Dhaka. Um, and, um, the, um, and, and this is also, I think, true of... Uh, I don't actually know when they built if when they built the Shinkansen or when they built the Jervesi Desk, they expected there to be more lines. I suspect so. They did expect success. Um, I, I think especially in the case, I, th I think in both cases, the um, success exceeded expectations, but it's not like they were unsure if anything would happen. I think they did expect there to, um, to be um, a lot of ridership coming from this. And... Um, and the expectations again, as I understand, were exceeded eventually, at least. But they were, um, but but I, but I expect that they would have planned there to be more. And I guess it's also true, especially of the Tokaido Shinkansen, because the um, Tokaido Shinkansen uh, does not stop at Osaka Station. Um, it's very rare, usually, unless you're in China, in the big cities, they always stop at the city center station. Um, this is Nagoya, this is not Osaka. Um, this is Osaka. Um, and we're going to see if I can find it. So um, the Tokaido line, I think, uh, so the Tokaido line enters the central business district and stops at this com at, at this complex where I'm never going to be able to tell on site which line belongs to what. And, I'm, and I apologize in advance, to, in, in, advance, in advance to Japanese rail fans for not knowing, uh, for not knowing Osaka um, on site. But um, the... Um, but the way it works is that there's a little bit of a loop. I guess it would be this one. So this should be the JR Rust. And it doesn't tell me. Okay. Um, is that there's this little loop-y thing through downtown Osaka, and then it goes back to the line. And um, the Tokaido Shinkansen does not do that. The Tokaido Shinkansen... Okay, then it's not this. It has to be this, I guess. The Tokaido Shinkansen stops just outside city center at Shin Osaka. And if you look pretty carefully, um, it's a little hard to tell that this is mainly so that it could um, extend to the west without having to plow through downtown Osaka. I mean, I'm pretty sure if they if they just wanted a, um, a terminus, they could have strung it around here or something. But they did want to extend it. In fact, now they now they remember the um, oldest plans for the Shinkansen um, from from the war uh, had the line going. To the southern tip of Honshu to Shimonoseki, so the so the, so they did plan there to be an expansion. Uh, Borners uh, about mar Singapore being mar more market oriented than boomer tourism. Okay, so Singapore specifically does not have any kind of uh, welfare gerontocracy, unlike the United Kingdom. Singapore, to the contrary. Make seventy-year-olds clean tables, but Singapore 
Um, but for example, the issue of land, it's pretty similar. It's the same kind of uh, leasehold situation. In Singapore, it's a little bit more explicitly state um, oriented than landlord oriented. But remember that the super rich in Singapore don't own land, they own things outside Singapore. Um, actually a lot of, I, I issued stream about Singapore at one point, but Singapore and Hong Kong specifically have this issue where um, uh, a lot of the people who in non-city states would just be living outside the city, live in the city and then travel a lot outside the city. And this, uh, and, and this for example, messes with emissions calculations because these are all international flights which are never counted as a single country's emissions. Oh God, yeah, and the new capital, which is just a silly idea. Um, and uh, well, Hong Kong is becoming less so um, so again, right? I mean, give Xi Jinping some credit. He wants to want to say he wants to turn to any other Chinese city, but probably a combination of any other Chinese city and an Uyghur concentration camp. Given how uh, given how they think of the um, average Hong Kong man, so. Um. So anyway, the so the point of a generational project is that it is not expected that there will be more, or if there are more, it's going to be in the distant future when the current elites are dead or not even retired in the sense of being sixty eight, technically retired but constantly commenting as a former head of whatever to the media. Um, I mean, like eighty five and, and like with advanced dementia. I mean a. 55 year old let's say um or 58 year old uh manager like, like not, not random manager i mean like c-suite type manager at the agency can see themselves at 68 not really at let's say 85 or 90. so um the point is that the generational project uh will attract a specific kind of, I don't know what to exactly call it. I don't, I'm not going to say NIMBY because NIMBYism is independent of how generational the project is. You need to deal with NIMBYs regardless because the point of a NIMBY is a NIMBY is an obstacle to your infrastructure to whatever, um, who is an obstacle on the grounds of not wanting real or perceived negative impact with their local area. This does not matter whether there's going to be another project in a different neighborhood in five years or not. Um, now, the NIMBY may uh, uh, um, the, so the NIMBY may make arguments uh, that center the generationality of a project, by which I mean, um, if you're only building one line at a time, let's call you Brussels. Now, Brussels, I, I'm not going to say that the metro line in Brussels is generational. They do build slowly but they build um and if you're building metal three um and uh nimbys uh oppose impact to their parks because the kind of standard is that you take parkland in order to build um entrances to the stations uh cheaply uh, because the park is not actually worth money and the housing that you would demolish is so i'm actually gonna switch from Brussels to Stockholm to give you an example of a station built in a park. Um, now, uh, it is, I believe, here. Sofia. Um, and you can see a little bit of the work, I think. Um, you can see a little bit of this work, I think. Um, so what they did is they opened up this park to build a cut and cover entrance to a station that is, in fact, deep mined. Um, it might be the deepest state, I think it's the deepest station in the system that's being built here. And um, it's going to be elevator access only. They can't even do slant access with escalators. It's, the, it's again, it's something like 90 meters or, or something like that deep or 100 meters deep. So this means that uh, uh, escalators would just be too much of a chore. You can slant drill, but um, slant drilling is not fun. And you need to slant drill from a very a uh, far away location because the angle of an escalator, right, it's 30 degrees. So to go 100 meters, you need to start 173 meters elsewhere. And that's difficult. So it's um, it's a bank of escal uh, not escalator, elevators. And then 
um, there's a horizontal escape route to the freeway that they used as a service tunnel for construction anyway, so we just keep it open as an evacuation route. Um, so what you do is you take the parks, and this is even if you're building a deep underground station, often the entrances are cut and cover. Um, also, um, I expect that people who are watching this are not very uh, um, familiar with the Swedish urban geography. Why would you unless you've lived there or somehow really familiar with um, Swedish social issues? Um, Stockholm is um, very... I'm not, I won't say Parisian, but really normal in that there is a, a standard gradient of centrality and income. So rich people, rich people, rich people. Um, and the farther away you go, the poorer you get. Also, as is pretty common, there's directionality. Um, there's a, there are poorer and richer directions. Generally, um, the richest direction is here. It's an area called um, Roslak. Um, in fact, it's the same... Uh, etymology as Russia, it's Ross. Um, it's like, I guess they considered this area the Ross, and then beyond that to the east, this was also Ross, and then Rus, and then Russia. Um, so, rich people. Uh, I think the wealthiest uh, municipality in Sweden is Danderud, this one. And uh, the uh, and then the suburbs to the west, this is west. In this context, very few people live here, as you might be able to tell, and to the south uh, are poor. Um, so, so, th so this area specifically very central, thus rather wealthy. Uh, this is Södermalm. Um, again, I don't expect you to know Swedish urban geography, so I'm just going to babble. Um, the more traditional rich people live in Normalm, so or whatever, like north of the north of city center. Uh, I lived here, by the way, because the uni is here. Um, I lived at the very margin of the regular built-up area. So I lived on somewhere around here. I don't remember which building. Um, technically, city center, like the uh, gates of the, the um, congestion pricing toll gates are around here, maybe, but nobody lives here. It's just the university. So the normal residential area ends here. Um, this is an area where I think even in the most recent election, um, they voted majority right and not majority left. Um, of course, very wealthy urban area, as you might expect, very few vote for the extreme right, but a lot of people vote for normie center right. Um, and Southern Mom is kind of the hippie area that um, thinks it's being uh, like, not that they're not bourgeois or something, even though they absolutely are. Um, and so this, as you might expect, might not be the most developmentalist place, but they just built anyway. I mean, it's, I mean, there's NIMBYism in Sweden, but they can build. Um, ooh, I have not seen any photos of the, of the Brussels Metro. If people want to post in comments, I will look. Um, and, um, so the norm at any rate is you open up the parks and you do it for free because it's public land. Um, if it doesn't happen, it means something's gone wrong. For example, in Istanbul, as soon as CHP won the municipal election, state-owned parks were no longer available for staging construction, only municipal parks. Um, er um, Erdogan is that petty. In the United States, there's a parks department that will extract money from the agency for construction. Now, this is something that is often related to the generationalness of the project and generationality because, oh, it's our once in a lifetime opportunity to extract 15 or once in a generation opportunity to extract money. It's not that's not, it's just bullshit. Uh, that's just bullshit. Uh, um, that's just some bullshit um, extraction. This is the Marx Brothers Playground, which uh, its location at uh, 2nd and 96th makes it very attractive for staging construction for Second Avenue Subway, um, and uh, the Parks Department charged the General to City the MTA fifteen million to use this for staging. Um, and uh, so again, this is just bullshit surplus extraction. Um, now NIMBYs, 
remember, we're still talking about NIMBYs. NIMBYs may argue um, differently against a generational project and a non-generational project. And we're going to take a break for 10 seconds because we're running out of light. You see, the problem with uh, streaming just after daylight saving starts is that um, it means that the sun sets during stream and not before or after. Um, ooh, nice. Nice. Okay, well, look. Oh, right. I can't click links on this. I keep forgetting. One of these days I will stop forgetting. But the, uh, but, but the point is that if the project is not generational, then NIMBYs will argue against it um, on special grounds of the specifics of the project because there are no others. So in the case of Brussels and M3, because it passes through some um, disadvantaged areas, the local, uh, I don't know whether to call them community leaders or self-appointed community leaders or whatever, just NIMBYs, um, have opposed the uh, construction of the line because of something like something something our parkland something something um now you get the park back when the construction is over but um now uh, now because this is again just the one line at this point they keep talking about how it's such a terrible way to treat such a uh such a dispossessed marginalized community and the funniest thing or i shouldn't call it funny it's i mean, shouldn't even call it sad the most outrageous thing is that this is Belgium. This is a country where um, the, the level of racial discrimination against people of color is very high. Um, and I don't mean it in the sense that it's very high everywhere. No. Um, Belgium, like France, is unusual. Like, it's a lot worse in both countries. And I think Belgium might be, even be worse in France than in, let's say, Germany or Britain. And um, so if the... Um, if the um, immigrants, if, if the first and second generation immigrants in this area were complaining about police brutality um, or, or, or about constant job discrimination or about um, uh, being politically treated as um, a problem in like the, the entire public discourse, people would tell them to pound sand, but now when the concern is about parks, suddenly the state listens? No, that's bullshit. So again, it's something that might be argued on a, spe on a specific case-by-case -case basis. Um, of course, in the United States, if you try to build one line through a black neighborhood, the NIMBYs will argue that it's racist to um, impact them. If you build the one line through a white neighborhood, the NIMBYs will argue that you're being too woke um, and, and you're being affirmative action, politically correct, something, something, and uh, it's going to bring crime to their neighborhood. And by crime, they always mean black people. So the, um, so the characteristics will change based on where the line is if it's just the one line if it's several lines at once that does not shut the nimbys up um oh shit um on impact fees and your reading racks not them are um what about land replace land readjustment style what do you mean um if you mean hong kong then it's trash um, in Copenhagen, they did uh, they did the tax increment financing for the metro, but that was just copying Britain. Um, oh, you mean the private railroads in Japan? Because the subway in Japan is built publicly, I think. Um, the the private railroads in Japan, it's, that's I I don't think that's land right? It's just it's just it's their land that they buy and then they develop it, um, and they pay market rate. Um, but also Japan. Japan is one of these places that are like Germany and that they can build but chose not to. Oh, oh, oh. Huh. Okay, then I don't actually know. Um, the Tsukovex is also weird because it's third sector. Um, is Tsukovex the only third sector in uh, Kanto? And sorry, when I say Kanto, I mean stuff that gets to Tokyo. I don't mean like random circumferential line between two. Um, places that are technically in Kanto but are not even suburbs of Tokyo. Oh, okay. Huh. What are the other third sectors? Um, and for the purpose of this discussion, I don't mean Toei. I think Toei is just a normal park. Oh, okay, 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 okay. But is Tsukuba Express the only one that goes into like 
central Tokyo. Um, but, but anyway, the what I'm saying is that NIMBYs exist even against multi-line systems. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh yeah, those. Yeah, yeah. The ex oh, you mean the ones that? I mean the extension lines. Yeah, yeah. The the line. Yeah, yeah. So the so the, so the toy lines, the ones that uh, extend. Uh, the one that extends Tozai to the east. Um, I don't remember what Saitama extends to the north. Is that Namboku? Um, or, or is that Mita? I think Namboku. Right, Mita is the weird one that bends northwest. Um, yeah, yeah, so and so anyway, and so NIMBYs also argue against multi-line products. Um, then they will say, oh, we have, uh, they're destroying all of our, downtown is destroying all of our neighborhoods. So for example, the Jane Jacobs style critique of um, highways was a NIMBY critique. Um, and this needs to be understood. Yeah, she stopped a highway that would have destroyed the neighborhood. Yeah, but it was a fundamentally NIMBY critique. She supported downzoning. She thought tall buildings were a nuisance like highways. And she proposed neighborhood empowering mechanisms that empowered a rich neighborhood like hers, the village, um, to resist highways, but did not so empower poor neighborhoods like where the Cross Bronx, free, uh, not freeway, the Cross Bronx Expressway went through. And so, um, oh, okay, okay, then on state on. That's the best I can tell you, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, so the critiques of, let's say, so the NIMBY critiques of highways in America grew at a time that it was not at all generational. It was viewed as an, 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 a perennial or, or, or a permanent road expansion program funded with the expectation that it should be a permanent road expansion program and um the um and and the sort of um nimbyism that we see all right cha cha um the sort of nimbyism that we see in germany um predates the decision of germany not to build um now of course generally if you build many lines it's likely you have less nimbyism not because nimbys have not because NIMBYs are less likely to object to um, multi-line systems, but because probably if you build a lot, then it means that you're able and willing to build. And one of the things that this includes is suppression of NIMBYism. So if you're Spain, you just have rules that disempower NIMBYs. And that is one of the many things that enables you to build um, so aggressively, at least when you have economic growth as the country did until the financial crisis. Um, and now that it's recovering, kind of, uh, it's going back to building. And if you're Germany, for example, and you emp empower NIMBYs, then you're just going to build less. Um, and this is the point of a generational project. Once you build so little that something is viewed as a once in a long while construction project, things are going to get worse. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in the German context and then in the American context, because these are two different uh, problems, the American problem and the German problem. Now, remember, the American problem is that America cannot build. Germany is different. Germany can build, but chooses not to. That is to say, um, Let's not even talk about the New York budget. The New York budget is $50 billion over five years for capital expansion and replacement. The expansion is a very large share of that. Just don't remember how large. It's not, when I say very large, I don't mean 80%. I, but I mean, I mean, I'm guessing maybe one half. I don't remember. Um, but it's, 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 it's at any rate a large share. It's a five year program, um, which includes a little bit of accessibility, something that Berlin is basically just doing right now and and it's not even a mega project it's just i don't even know how many tens of it, it's tens of millions of euros not even hundreds of millions of euros to complete um the um the there are uban expansions that the city wishes to build and is kind of bad at planning but or but to say bad it's more like there's a lot of political controversy over them and I suspect it's because they're viewed as generational by mostly by green activists who impose early deadlines and then argue, and this is what I'm going to talk about what's wrong, the idea that it's faster to build tramways than to build subways. 
Um, and then there's the American issue, which is America can't build. That said, I'm bringing up both countries um, in analogy because what because there is an American history to this. The American history is that um, throughout the middle of the 20th century, um, when there came the idea to expand urban mass transit, this is maybe late 50s, 60s, when um, people realized that maybe cars can't be full replacement for every single kind of public transportation. Um, the, the plans were to build what was most familiar to American planners, which was, of course, what was then the busiest subway system in the world, that of New York. Um, I think Tokyo. I don't actually know when Tokyo overtook New York. Um, would have been probably, I'm guessing, 1970s, maybe. Um, Tokyo had a very aggressive expansion in the 60s and into the 70s, and then New York collapsed in the 70s. I think that's when they intersected. Um, and and Moskva, Moskva might have actually only take, overtaken New York in the 90s. It's entirely possible. If not, it probably again would have been pretty late. Um, and if not New York, then you look at maybe Boston, Chicago, um, Philadelphia. And um, so this led to the Great Society subways. There's something called the Great Society subway, which is Washington, but um, BART is the same uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and uh, actually Atlanta, Marta, um, is of the same uh, era. I think it opened a little later, but it was planned um, along the same principles as Washington and the Bay Area. Uh, and... The thing is, the construction cost of these rose rapidly in the 70s. Um, that was one of the origin stories of uh, research into cost overruns um, in the 80s, early 90s. And, um, the, uh, and the response of the United States to this was to um, downgrade. So these cities were already building subways, uh, but... Subsequently, starting in I think the late 70s, people got the idea of light rail. Now, light rail was not just subway, but inferior. Light rail was an actually well-thought idea, the way it was done in the 70s. And I keep talking about Germany um, in the United States. Well, it was co-invented, in a way, in the United States and in Germany. So in Germany, let's, let's switch to Germany for a moment. In Germany, we also had, uh, we, I, nobody in my family lived in Germany between, I want to say between 1933 and, and 2019, but that is false because my Holocaust survivor grandfather um, spent a little bit of time at a displaced person camp um, in, I think, Bavaria in like 45, 46 before um, making Aliyah. So um, the... Um, but you know what I mean. Um, so Germany built a lot of subways in the largest cities, that is to say Hamburg, München, and West Berlin. This was full subways. Uh, in Nuremberg, it was also full subway, and everywhere else in West Germany, it was something called the Stadtbahn, which is in America called subway surface. So the idea was, um, it's the 60s, everyone's getting a car, uh, you want to make the city car friendlier, and also there's a lot of congestion. So you're going to bury the central sections of the tramways. I'm gonna maybe Dor maybe Dortmund is the best place to show a Stadtbahn because it has the simplest multi-line system. Um, so the so instead of having a web of city center tramways, um, they had they built they consolidated to three subway lines. This, this, and this, and then a lot of surface lines would feed them, um, branching again on the surface. Um, the Frankfurt U-Bahn is a Stadtbahn, the Köln system, the, the Hannover system, the Stuttgart system, um, and uh, the, so essentially this was built as an upgrade of the streetcars. Now in the United States, by the time this got, the idea got to America in the seventies. The streetcars were all gone. There was not, there were no streetcars to upgrade, with uh, the exceptions of San Francisco, and maybe Seattle. I don't remember. I, I, I'm, I don't think the Link Light Rail was the, the Link Light Rail ended up being a subway surface line, but I think it was entirely built new as opposed to 
burying central sections of pre-existing um, streetcars and then um, removing the streetcars that could not be so connected. And uh, the um, uh, um, and the, and now the light rail systems, because they were built de novo, again, other than San Francisco, they had to do something a little different. And again, I, I talk about how it's a German import. Um, in the Cold War, the United States had significant military forces in Germany. Uh, and um, it was normal to, for, to serve in the military. The, I mean, for a while there was the draft, um, but even when there wasn't, I mean, even now, I mean, someone who does a couple years stint and then comes back to civilian life will generally be respected. Um, and so a lot of these vets saw the German planning ideas in the 60s and 70s and then brought them back to North America. Um, and this was most successful where there was no pre-existing transit system. Um, so the largest light rail systems in North America, what are they? They're, uh, so uh, um, I think the single largest at this point by ridership is Los Angeles, but for a while it was Calgary. So it's L I think it's LA, it's LA, San Diego, Sacramento, uh, Denver, Portland. Portland, I think, is the most famous, but it's not actually that great. Calgary and Edmonton. Um, and then Vancouver kind of was the uh, quirky kid in the bunch, which instead of building light rail, built an, a driverless metro and also happens to have the highest transit usage and model split among all of these places. Uh, and so this was not a bad idea. The idea of building light rail it was done correct early on. The problem is um, this turned into a kind of ratcheting mo model warfare in which people say, oh, subways are too expensive, let's build light rail instead. Oh, light rail is too expensive, let's build buses, but bus rapid transit instead. And then the problem is if your look, so if your construction costs are high, then they're not high because of geology, okay? Amsterdam, yeah, Amsterdam, and in place like Amsterdam, so very difficult geology, uh, alluvial soil, um, I think it is justifiable to have a tram-based system and try to avoid building subways where possible. Also, the Netherlands is, has institutional difficulties building, which are essentially, uh, yeah, the stuff that happened before the DP camp was worse. Uh, no Seattle, again, I don't remember the history of Seattle. Seattle currently has a stop on, um, but I don't remember if, it was, if the outer parts of Link were original. I don't think they were. I think they built the entire system as a thing, as, as one thing. Um, and usually Stadtbahns um, are subway and city center and uh, streetcar mode outside. <laughs> and uh, it's not just a UNIMBY, but you UNIMBY, but also um, the Netherlands has a lot of um, Anglicisms. Uh, and uh, the like institutional anglicisms, for example, the civil service is unusually uh, weak. They rotate uh, top civil servants between different ministries to avoid give, to, to avoid having them be too expert in their field because that would give them too much power and they don't want to be like Italy, which can build. Um, so instead they can't build. And um, but anyway, uh, American light rail or North American light rail is, uh, has a similar history as the Stadtbahn. Um, not history as in Stuttgart or but same history of planning, but the but it's slow, that is to say, in street from within city center, and then they go on rights of way, often disused railways, uh, outside. Um, or maybe uh, freeway medium is the inferior option. Um, and so the problem is high cost, except in weird circumstances like alluvial soil, tend to be institutional. And if your high costs are institutional, the institutions don't stop existing when you switch modes. It's not like you have bad institutions for subways and then good ones for tramways. Now, what you can have is relative institutions. Now, what I mean by relative institutions, and this gets to the Berlin critique, the Berlin Green critique of subways that are supposed to be slower to build than tramways. Now, there's nothing that makes a subway inherently slower to build than a tramway. You look at the, how long it took to build um, U-Bahn's 
is the history of Germany and the kind of typical time is about the, the, the typical lead time from when construction starts and when the line opens is around six years. Um, and um, now this has gotten longer. Um, I'm actually going to check the present lines in Berlin, but my understanding is that in Berlin it's longer, but it's longer because of um, delays. It's not because it's inherent to the mode. Um, now there are longer lead times for uh, um, now there are longer lead times for uh, uh, planning. Okay, um, so U55 took five years, and then the connection to U5 took 10. Um, this is unusual, and this is also unusually difficult geo um, geology, which again, normally favors trans, but given how central it is, just bite the bullet and build the subway, it's useful, which they did. Um, or likewise in Rome, there are, there are a bunch of things that took longer, but um, the easy parts of line C were six years. This took um, 10, this is taking 10, but this is also, Literally, you're tunneling underneath the, or right next to the Roman Colosseum. So, uh, the again, very difficult, uh, very, very difficult geology. It's also much more expensive. Cost of this, cost of the easy stuff. Um, and so there are, now, the, what is true is that there is a substantial planning lead time. Now, the construction time again is four, five, six years. Uh, but um, sometimes even a bit, a bit le like three is not normal, but five, six is. And by the way, if you're wondering why line fourteen is four is fourteen years, if you're if you're uh, if your eyes wander, this is because it opened in uh, multiple phases. Most of the line I think opened maybe nineteen nine or over two thousand. Um, there was a cave in during construction that delayed a uh, the, the la that delayed a short section, but not most of the line. Yes, I am in fact saying that the reason why uh, that San that earthquakes in San Francisco are not the reason why the construction costs in San Francisco are higher than in uh, th than in famously uh, geologically uh, inert uh, Italy. Um, you see this? This actually is in uh, San Francisco. Uh, these ruins are actually in San Francisco. This is a uh, very old history of San Francisco. That's why it's impossible to uh, build anything there. Um, the, the city has a uh, several thousand uh, year history. Um, so now what is true is that there is lead time for... Uh, there is lead time for planning, but the planning lead time is political. The planning lead time exists because politicians choose to meddle, because politicians choose to argue for certain lines and not others through political negotiations. This is the thing that I'm never going to tire of saying until this line fucking opens, which is, this is, so most of this is crayon. This bit is not crayon. This bit is by far the most important piece of infrastructure Berlin should be building. Now, this is a short line. It's not at all a mega project. Nobody thinks of it as a mega project. Even when Berlin builds very little, it's understood to be a short extension. Um, it's also a short extension that has very high projected ridership relative to its length. Again, relative to its length, it's not 100,000 people. Or, it's not that there are 100,000 people that are going to use this. I wish. Melkisches Viertel is not that big. Um, so the actual, so, so the, the projection is about 14,000 per, uh, rider, I believe. 1414, not 440. Um, 13,000, sorry. Uh, and so, uh, I bring this up because, um, the... Uh, there's been a lot of political negotiations over what goes, goes in the plan and what doesn't. The people in this area, of course, want the expansion, but these people don't vote green because they live outside the ring and basically nobody who lives outside the ring votes green. The Green Party said, well, we should do trams, Ubans offend us, let's build trams, not to Mekishas Fiatel, to other places. And there's just a lot of political delay. Um, somehow, by the way, 
well, Nike shifts Fiat to the low income housing project um, gets delayed. The part that is actually being advanced the most is the expansion to the airport. Um, and so, uh, so this is a real thing is being planned. This is being planned. Um, not this, but the shorter thing is being planned. And this is being planned. These are the main things that are being planned right now. And um, so, um, so this exists because it's not exactly generational, but it's kind of generational. Berlin just does not expand very much. And people, and because it doesn't expand very much, people expect it to keep not expanding. So everything is decided at the top level. Now, bear in mind, Berlin, now again, this is crayon and a lot of this is bullshit. Um, actually, about half of the stuff here on the plan that is not in existence is bad. Like most of this ring is just bullshit. Um, a few of these other lines also are. Um, the other half are very good lines, like this, especially. Again, this this section, like U2 and U9. Um, and so the... Um, by the way, I don't even hate on the expansion to their part. I just think it's priority number three and not priority number one. Priority number one, this. Um, and so because of... So a Berlin that actually built this where this was part of the normal plan, where it's expected that the, oh, that the city should reach 300-something kilometers of U-Bahn within, I don't know, 30 years, is a city where nobody gives a shit about two kilometers except planners, because politicians, are, what, are, um, what are they going to say? Well, they're going to talk about big things. So if the plan is to actually build this, like, and I don't mean crayon, I mean plan where they can tell you this is how much it's going to cost, it's gonna be this section of the budget. Here, it's how it's gonna get built. Um, if this is the plan, then yeah, the Green Party is gonna say, well, this is too much. We need streetcars. Growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the of the cancer cell. Um, and the, which is for the record, a line that I've heard from actual degrowthers, um, and more, more than one, and um, it's just, they would say things like this, and maybe we should expand streetcars instead. But what are they going to go after? They're not going to go after two kilometers. They're going to go after, I don't know, half the plan. Hopefully the worst half. Of the, hopefully they're not going to kill, you know, Nekishas Fiota or um, expansions in Pankow or expansions in, uh, into East Berlin and then keep the ring, right? It's good, hopefully going to be the other way around. But it's going to be, but, but the stuff that gets discussed is the big stuff. And then this does not have a long planning lead time because it's actually a technically very easy thing to build. Like, look at it. Um, this is the geography of Mekisches Viertel. Um, this is a modernist housing project. This is not narrow streets. This is not old infrastructure of any kind. This is a wide arterial with, um, with a lot of setbacks, um, tree-lined, um, building to building distance, and I'm going to try to draw it not to this, but to the shorter lot line. That's like 35 meters um, or 33 meters. That's fine. You can cut and cover two tracks under this. And they're not going to, I don't think, because I actually don't know if this is cut and cover. I mean, they can even go deep. That's, I mean, it's, it's going to be money, but it's not that much money. Um, and then the idea is to get from uh, Wilmsle Dam to into the project and just look at this. There's space. There's space for whatever the fuck you want. This is not technically difficult. Um, and because of that, the planning lead time can be short because the politicians are not going to give a shit if this is two kilometers out of even 60, let alone 160, which again, as I said in my previous video or in the blog post that I'm highlighting, the 160 is excessive. But two out of 60 is still... Is still not enough to lead to political. To political, I don't know what to call it. The it's in French it would be called polemic, but um, I don't know if there's a good word for that in English because polemic means something a little different. On in online English, it's called discourse with capital D. Um, but it's not a standard English word. Like in standard English, you say discourse, and it's much more neutral, um, and it has little, if any, connotation of negativity um, or of uh, uh, or of uh, stupidity. Aww. 
Thank you. Yeah, so the point is that um, the Greens are only making an effort to block this or, or whatever because it's two kilometers out of 10 or, or something like that, not out of 60. So when you downgrade, you invite more, um, you, you invite more micromanagement, more meddling. Um, and the thing is, this is what's letting some tramway projects happen. Now, to be very clear, Berlin also has a very long lead time in planning trams. The idea that trams are faster to plan than the subways is bullshit. Yeah, one tramway expansion is happening, but I mean, a lot of the promised trams, like a lot of the lines here, the ones, maybe not, I should not show the crayon, I should show the more serious map, this one. Um, a lot of these lines, uh, a lot of these lines, the left government that is apparently leaving, uh, downgraded to tram, so there's a plan to make this a tram. Um, this, to some extent, is already a tram. Uh, let me actually see if they're depicting the trams because that would be easiest. Yeah, they are depicting the tram. So this is a tram. Um, the plan is to, I don't know if it's along this exact line, but along something like this alignment, extend the tram to um, Jungfernheide and not extend U5 as they should. Um, but that's not happening. That's also being delayed. And the point is that if you're building 60 kilometers of subway, two of them are not going to matter. Yeah, if they're the two most marginal of the 60 can be dropped, but not because they're not going to be, it's not going to be the only two kilometers that are going to be dropped. So Grand Paris Express, 200 kilometers. Yeah, there's a lot of political controversy over the weaker parts of it. Unfortunately, the weaker parts of it are being built. The money should have been diverted to other things, but... These are, but people were arguing about two kilometers. They were arguing over M18 and M17. This is a large chunk of the program. Um, they're never going to say, oh, the, we shouldn't build subway, we shouldn't build metro tunnels or, or whatever because of growth, because growth is bad or it's all going to be gentrification, which is, to be clear, a point that some community leaders, like, I don't know if leaders, community. I don't want to say community members because anyone, everyone, community, the, the sort people with very pro-community, anti-regional or anti-state views held. It's just that it's France. Nobody cares what they think. And um, people are still going to say that. It's just, it's not going to turn one line into a, into political football. What is going to become political football is, yeah, the entire system. The 200 kilometers of Grand Paris Express are a political decision. They have to be. They're spending... In today's money, I think something like 40 billion euros on that. Yeah, 40 billion euros is going to be a decision that um, maybe the president does not care about, but the minister of transport, the state minister of transport, does care about. Um, so, yeah, that's to some extent unavoidable because France, again, France is a country that wants to build and can build. Now, France is gradually losing its ability to build, but it's losing its ability to build from such a... Um, and just such low, because when I say low cost, I mean Sweden 50 years ago, but from such low-ish costs that it can still build. It still builds out of it can, it can still build a bunch of air lines, a bunch of metro lines, um, a lot of uh, metro and, and uh, air lines in provincial cities. Um, it's going to take them, I think, another generation at this rate to fully advertise. And so when you do that, yeah, people are going to argue over the marginal parts of the plan. They're going to argue over the plan in general. Um, but that, in some way, protects both the strongest elements of the plan and the smaller elements of the plan. So when I say stronger, again, strong, there is a strongest thing in Berlin U-Bahn construction, which is this, not just the stuff that says on the... On the, the um, um, Adam, I mean, the stuff that enters the project. Um, and um, the, um, but also trams. So if you have a plan to expand the U-Bahn, I don't know, 70 kilometers or something, or uh, and also expand the tramway system by another 70 kilometers, the tramway expansions are going to be small. So yeah, they're going to look easier to build. And this is what's happening in Germany. When there are combined plans, and Berlin does have combined plans. There are U-Bahn expansion plans, um, like the connection to the airport, which is not under construction, but that's just because they're slow. But it's intended to be under construction, even in the outgoing coalition. Uh, 
No, it's not actual engineering. These are easy projects. Um, so U5, um, the project that took 10 years, that was actually difficult um, because it had two undercrossings here and here and also went under the river and also built a station under the river where they had to freeze the soil. That's engineering problems. Um, this is the easiest thing to build ever, as is this. Um, as is this. Um, this is not trivially easy, but it is... The hardest part would be crossing this, and this part has already been built in anticipation that this should be extended. Like the... Um, so the, the, the station for this line, for the U5 exp um, extension here, has been built in conjunction with the actually in use U7 station. Um, so the... Um, so yeah, if you do a combined plan with expansions of all things, uh, of... In this case, all three, I guess, because Espan, Uban, and, and tramways, then yeah, the Uban is going to suck the oxygen out of the room. People say, well, if it had only been light rail, it would have been easier. Well, no, because if you only build light rail, then light rail is the generational investment, and then light rail is what's politicized. And I bring up American and German history in conjunction because this is exactly what happened in the United States. Um, in the United States, again, the construction costs in the 1970s were worse than they are in Germany today. I believe BART, um, I think BART was 230 million a kilometer dollars. It would not be today's dollars, it would be 2017 dollars. So in today's, my, I don't know, 280 or something. Let me quickly check something. Uh, I have the construction costs of the uh, Washington Metro somewhere and Instead of trying to remember the source, I can just look up my blog posts. Um, so, Suburban Metro... Okay, the... My native browser renders numbered lists in a not very readable way, but yeah, okay. The actually built Washington Metro cost $25 billion in today's money for a 166 kilometers of which 72 are underground. So um, this is, um, if the underground is all that there is, it's $350 million a kilometer, which makes it noticeably more expensive than uh, average German cost today in the same geography as uh, Washington DC. Um, this is about what it costs to build U5, and U5 was not average geography. It was almost worst case geography. Um, now, there is, now, now, the stuff that's not underground in DC is not elevated. It's in freeway medians. Uh, so I'm going to score it as one-sixth um, the underground and not one-half the underground. It's usually a one-in-six ratio, uh, like a six-to-one ratio between light rail, sorry, a six to one ratio between sub between underground and light rail. Um, in Germany, people even say 10 to one. I don't think 10 to one is correct. 10 to one is actual subways and actual light rail, but usually light rail here is built on easier alignments. Um, if you do it six to one, then it's equivalent to 87 ish kilometers. So 200, yeah, so a little bit more expensive than. Europe is in German construction today, and this was in the 1970s. Um, and uh, so America was poorer in the 1970s than it is today, poorer than Germany is today. And um, the so the downgrade of lines to light rail, uh, again, happened in a higher cost environment than when people in Germany want to do it. But what happened was that, uh, what happened was that suddenly instead of people having polemical debates about a subway that are such a reason for co for cost increases. And this is actually a, a place where the best example to look at is, I remember I talked about uh, the importance of studying non-mega projects. I study mega projects, but other people study non-mega projects. Well, let's talk about someone who I've met named Zach Lesko. Um, so there's, so it's Leah Brooks and Zach Lesko. Lesko is the one among these that I've talked to. He, 
it was it, it was a conversation with many other people so um it's not like i can give highlights from a conversation with him he seemed pretty solid in the conversation but again it's not there were a lot of other people in the um, on that call so i can't give you more detail than he seemed solid but anyway um they talk about the cost explosion in american highways in the 60s and 70s and uh they talk about citizen voice um essentially nimbyism that is empowered through uh litigation so adversarial legalism uh and uh this leads to compromise groups that are both worse and uh more expensive now worse is from the perspective of the engineer so often this means uh so this means that for a highway it's more circuitous um but often it's um, but but often it's also something that's not actually better from the perspective of let's say avoiding greenhouse gas emissions because that would mean just not building the highway if you build the highway but it just goes less directly that's not going to save the planet um if you build it, but you build it narrow yeah that saves the planet it means less car capacity but if you build it and then instead of going direct it goes it zigzags yeah i'm sure it makes some people choose to drive less because the road is more because the road is not as direct never remember where the best example of the zigzag is um this looks like it was in the right of way like like some kind of river um but okay but people are just going to drive longer distance because the okay i don't know if the if this kind of uh indirect route was because of nimbyism or another reason but something like this yeah i mean sure you can say discourages driving by um by being less direct than going whoop but uh people are just going to drive longer distances so um that's not so it's something that so it's routes that i don't think are discouraging driving to the point of actually reducing emissions reducing um pollution redu- reducing car accidents um but again things that maybe avoid specific rich people neighborhoods things that um uh uh things that involve more engineering uh maybe things that involve more giveaways to the um more giveaways to, again i don't want to say community because it's a specific subset of the community the example is in la la's last freeway was the century freeway um and again at the time freeway construction was not viewed yet as generational uh but still nimby's and highway revolters managed to extract so much value which included things that are completely useless the, like for example there's a light rail line in the media the green line the green line in la is very useless it was supposed to connect the airport with norwalk now the problem is they only built it in the median of the freeway so the line ends so so the green line ends around here um uh, here i guess and it doesn't actually get to where they wanted to go which was the norwalk commuter rail station I guess it's somewhere here. It's not shown. No, it's here. This is a different line. It's here. They didn't get all the way here. And at the western end, they didn't actually get all the way to the airport. They got to a um, to just outside airport grounds where you can connect to a shuttle bus, or more likely, you're just going to drive the whole way, because this also doesn't get you anywhere except the freeway. I mean, yeah, there's a there's a connection to the blue line here. Okay, whatever. Um, and so the so they got a light rail line that is very greenwashing in the sense that it just doesn't get a lot of ridership the whole point of public transportation is to get ridership if you're not getting ridership on public transportation then uh uh then what's the point the the whole remember public transportation is good for urban development right but to the extent that people ride it it's good um for more accessibility um accessibility for the entire city but that is same people writing it's good for a uh, model shift for creating an alternative to driving and reducing all of the negative impacts associated with driving but the model shift happens to the extent people actually use the trains right if people don't use the trains the trains are not going to are definitionally not shifting mo- um modes they're not shifting mo- model choice away from driving and that is the problem with the green line. Oh, by the way, but um the construction of the railroad, I mean 250 in that era was not high. It was not low. 250 in the 70s um or 280 in the 70s. Um first of all, this was already at a premium. It was not a huge premium. It was I think maybe a factor of one and a half ish premium over 
the construction cost of the UK um, and Germany at the time, Italy was maybe a little bit more expensive, especially when bribes were involved. And then Italy shut down construction because bribes were involved and uh, redid its system to, for example, have a lot more transparency is what I keep stressing. And then with the transparency, Italian construction costs substantially fell. Um, German ones are a little bit higher now than they were there. And they were then, except Germany is a much richer country now. And British costs have just skyrocketed because they privatized the state. And American costs have also skyrocketed. Um, because Amer Americans didn't privatize the state the way Britain did. They just underinvested in it. It's kind of like Reagan side regulation. Reagan never actually did any, any deregulation. Reagan just appointed political hacks who would always take industry's position on any regulatory dispute, but didn't actually do any formal deregulation the way Carter formally deregulated airfares or formally deregulated freight rail fares, huh, fares rates. Um, so, but, but anyway, no, Washington, I, mean, I would not call Washington metros 280 per kilometer in the 70s low. Yeah, it was lower than New York. It's still lower than New York. Um, just both numbers are a lot higher. Um, and again, BART, I don't remember. I think BART today would be about 280-ish as well, but I, again, don't remember if BART cost as well. Um, so yeah, it's all about political horse trading, and the political horse trading is about the stuff that matters to politicians. Um, and this can make you think that, oh, if there's, a, if there's political controversy, just shrink the program. Now, in some cases, you should shrink the program, okay? Um, I, so I imagine that you guys know that I love Alfred Tu. If you do not know who Alfred Tu is, Alfred Tu, um, they are a um, housing activist um, and a transit act and a local transit activist. Uh, they are uh, a graphic designer, uh, and they have a lot of really cool graphic design uh, that is uh, essentially the rage of millennials in the 2010s. Uh, now, th this is... Uh, now, they can also do illustrations. So the example is uh, there's missing middle housing. Um, for people who don't know, it's something that I think is kind of overrated. But uh, this is the... But this is, there, there's, it's a specific kind of development that is, let's call it row houses. Um, I guess Borners is not here, so I can't tell him that this is um, outer London. But it's this is um, called Missing Middle. The idea is that mid-rises, like normal inner Berlin uh, or early 20th century New York. So, I mean, of course, New York has skyscrapers, but not a lot of people live in residential high-rises. And, and basically nobody did until, like, I don't know, 1930s or something. Um, so in New York, the traditional housing topology in Manhattan is six to ten stories. So this is mid-rise. This is like Berlin is mid-rise, like six to eight floors, I think. Um, the idea is that um, these are expensive to build and they're only allowed to be built in small areas. This is single family. So missing metal is stuff in between that is supposed to be, well, missing, except my critique is it's not actually missing, except in Canada. In Canada, absolutely. Everywhere else, no. And this is not Canadian spelling. This is um, an American site. In America, this is not missing. This is just outer New York, like past the subway. Um, so at any rate, riffing off of missing middle, um, Alfred also made missing large for uh, various uh, forms of mostly social uh, housing that could be built uh, at, at higher density near, for example, BART. Um, they're very barrier and, and missing small things that are uh, not large single family, but essentially single family that's af affordable for poor people, um, like uh, mobile homes, manufactured homes. These are things that are a, a low end American housing topology. In America, nearly everyone lives single family. This is single family, it's, uh, except it's small, um, mass produced, often the quality is lower, but it's therefore more affordable, and therefore uh, quite a lot of places have zoning laws prohibiting trailer parks because if poor people don't live in your area then that's maybe a solution to poverty i guess um i mean i live in germany and people here 
have such solutions to certain, maybe not poverty, but um, other well-known problems to Western civilization. Um, I'm just going to try to find the map. Now, if you know Alfred Drew and you know the map, then you know what I mean. Okay, I can't find it. I'm just going to Alfred Drew the map. The, when you say Alfred to the map, it's from 10 years ago at this point. Um, because when I say millennial rage, uh, millennial rage, what I mean is it was actually when millennials were old and uh, were not old, were now we're old, where millennials were young enough to have this kind of rage at the unemployment rates of 10 years ago. This is... No, we don't need to talk about my ad block, and we need to talk about your ads. Um, this is the map. Now, you can maybe make a, an economic argument against it. Um, which I have, which is that this connection is trash. I mean, not all the way to Vegas, but the this and this are trash. Like this, like a lot of this is good, but the through connections from the Eastern system and the West Coast are bad. Again, and I love Alfred. Now, if this is maybe the plan, then maybe I can say, okay, this is there's a lot of very good stuff in it, but like maybe I don't know. I don't know how long it is. I'm not gonna check. It's maybe one third of it is too weak and should not be on the map. Um, that is absolutely a thing you're allowed to say. Like, again, this is very, um, this is an, this is internally, again, an economic argument. Um, and yeah, that's not, it's not what happens. It, there are weak parts you can kill. Um, but the point is to discuss this entire map. And if you discuss the part of the map that I've made, I've made, um, someone else has made it um, based on my not as artistic crayon. Uh, it's this map. Um, then this is the plan. This is still a big plan. Like the difference between this and this is not that bad. And yeah, we'll defend this one, but keep things in proportion. This is not that much smaller and similar in concept, but it means that people say, oh yeah, let's build this, let's build whatever. Um, that is the discussion. This is the, this is what gets to be fair, neither Berlin nor early 20th century New York had the super deep double stairwell mid-rises, correct. Um, but that is that that is an issue that's very easy to overrate. I don't think it's overrated. I think it's an underrated issue because I think too many Americans are rather EMB still reflexively defend the regulations that require two stairways, two, two, stair, uh, two, two stairways per mid-rise building, which is just bonkers. Mid-rise buildings here are single staircase. I live in a single stair building. Our fire death rate is lower than in the United States. In fact, every European country, I'm not really sure about Eastern Europe, every never communist European country is has a lower fire death rate than the United States, except Greece, which is barely a developed country anymore, and uh, Finland, where everything is built out of wood. Um, and but it's very easy to also overwrite the importance of this issue. You can build double stairwell mid or high rises with like approaching 90% efficiency um, if they're big enough. And um, if you have scissor stairs, which New York, I believe, permits. Uh, and so the, um, and so, yeah, it's an issue, but for let's say modern New York, it's not the issue. There are way worse issues. Um, but anyway, the so the point is that this is a big map, and I don't mean big in the sense of America being big. I mean big in the sense that I'm proposing a lot of things, and I will defend. I will affirmatively defend every single line here in thick color, and I will also defend this thin color line. Um, a lot of people think it's marginal. I will defend it, um, and there are even things that are not in the map that I think can be defended, like St. Louis to Kansas City. Um, and uh, New Haven to Springfield, I think, also as well. What is also as well? Also can be defended. Anyway, the point is that, um, yeah, you can say there's not enough money. We can build, we, it's, it'll take a while to build, build this and then expand. That's fine. But this is a plan. Now, if you do a Northeast Carter only plan, then that is going to be um, the part that the politicians most care about. Um, and this is the current situation. The current situation in the United States is that politicians at very high levels care about this. I've been told that Joe Biden asks about Northeast Carter high-speed rail at briefings about infrastructure. Um, I don't know if he's done this 
how often he's done this. Maybe it's something only happened twice or something. But this is something that the president cares about. And as I understand it, from, to be fair, watching other middle brow things, not just the West Wing, but people are like, probably like the modern pundit equivalent of the West Wing. People say there's only like two thirds of the job of the president of the United States is foreign policy. So someone whose current job is mostly making sure that Hungary actually votes to let Finland um, join NATO um, and that uh, Ukraine gets the weapons that the United States is willing to give it and um, that, and that Putin doesn't get too many ideas, but also that Ukraine doesn't get such ideas as that the United States just give it old planes. Um, that, um, and someone whose job is mostly that is asking about this line. And this is because the current plan, yeah, in theory, there are maps like that are roughly this size, but again, they're crayon. The stuff that's actually being planned is this. And yeah, people, the politicians will care about the top level things you plan. And guess what? This is not even a high speed rail plan, what is currently being planned. It's a medium speed rail plan. It's $117 billion, it should be 20, for, for five hours, Boston to, Boston to Washington, it should be three and a half. And so, um, this is actually an example where you downgrade from high speed rail to medium speed rail, but the politicization is still there. Now, bear in mind, um, politicization is generally a bad thing. I will tell you that, um, yeah, um, airport connectors are easier to get moving. Yes, this is for a bunch of reasons. Politicians like flying, um, the middle class likes flying, so it's less for the working class, and also a lot of people fly, by which I mean uh, a normal transit extension. Let me see if uh, did I already kill the who pretty um did i already kill yeah let's go what the hell did i do um so again what are what so in berlin what should be the top maybe that's too crying whatever in berlin what should be the top priority is a line that is going to get a lot of ridership if built um this one but who's going to write it? The people of Magisha's Fiatal, they're going to use it twice a day. This line will get good ridership, less relative to the amount built. Good enough that, again, it should be built. I think it's priority number... Maybe... I don't want to say two, because I might overt as well. I'll say that after this, probably the highest priority is... Getting to Tegel, maybe? Like, two, three... Four, um, five is how I would write the priorities, and um, but who writes this? Many people going to the. I mean, yeah, the people living in the proposed redevelopment zones will write this twice a day, but it's mostly going to be people from all over the city, um, who for some reason are closer to U seven than to the S bahn. We're just going to write it to the airport, so it's many people who are going to write it not twice a day, but a few times a year. Um, so it's like more distributed, I think. Is, is, is the reason airport connectors are easier to find. Uh, I mean, yes, the remember that Britain loves corrupt Eastern European right-wingers because the corrupt Eastern European right-wingers being corrupt make the EU less workable, even if their purported... So even if their purported goals are not anti-European, in practice... Like peace loves doing that. Uh, um, so the but I mean to be fair, Britain is more into Poland, which then which is not as corrupt. Poland is just anti for the sake of being anti. Uh, but anyway, is the but, but anyway the um so the, so the point is that that Northeast Carter line. Even though they downgraded from high speed rail to medium speed rail and that's supposed to be faster, every German will tell you, oh, we can't build high speed trains. Let's just start to optimize the medium speed rail, uh, rail system we have. And wait, when you actually make it a formal plan that the main thing to do is medium and not high speed rail, and I don't mean the combo, I don't mean the Deutschland Takt. The Deutschland Takt is a combo of high and low of me and medium speed rail. The Deutschland Takt includes some high speed lines that are to be built, for example, Stuttgart to uh, Stuttgart to Ulm and even Augsburg or Frankfurt to Mannheim um, for such reasons as capacity. Um, it's not a fully medium speed system. Um, 
and there are also planned to be uh, more. There also is planned to be more usage of the high speed line, so that instead of only I think three trains a day, the direct Berlin Munich trains that go through Halle and not Leipzig are gonna go are, are gonna go um, hourly instead of three hours a day. So it's gonna be four hour less than four hours. It's gonna be upgraded to um, I think three hours fifty, and so it's a bunch of upgrades. And, and bear in mind, three hours fifty Berlin to München. Via Halle is, I think, 160 kilometers an hour average speed, whereas the medium speed plan for the Northeast corridor is about 140, 145 maybe. And the point is that um, if you actually have a plan to only go medium speed because high speed is too hard, this is not a this is not going to be as easy as building medium speed line in a country that builds high speed rail like Germany. This is going to be as hard as building medium speed lines in a country that only builds medium speed lines like the United States, because these are going to get politicized. Now, to be very clear, the political actors that they complain about are petty. The president of the United States is not petty. Um, again, I've heard, I've literally told you all I've heard about, about his contribution. Um, I've talked to people who have talked to him about this. Um, I didn't talk to those people about him. Again, there were many, many people on that call. Um, my um, impressions of federal, even federal appointees, not just federal civil servants, is for the most part positive. Like there, there are morons there, but there are morons in every organization almost. Um, like I don't think the Transit Cost Project has morons, but for the most part, we have four people. Um, and yeah, I can tell you that the people that I hire are not are not morons, but I'm not hiring a lot of people. And yeah, I mean, if there are going to be a lot of presidential appointees, some of them are morons. But I don't see any of the pettiness that I see by local actors. So the fact that the president cares, that by itself is not bad. I want to make it very clear. The fact that the president cares might actually get things moving. I don't know. I've never talked to the man. Um, unless you count receiving automated emails from him when I once was on some Democratic Party mailing list like 15 years ago. Um, maybe it would have been less than 15 years ago because specifically, because I remember I got, I got the email from him qua vice president. So he was already vice president at the time. And um, the, so I guess four, 13, 14 hours ago, whatever. Um, but the, um, so when I say politicization, I mean local actors. I mean, people in Connecticut who think that um, losing 100 houses to a straighter right of way through Darien is impossible. Often, and they, never, it's, they never even say it's bad. They just say, oh, it's impossible. Um, it's kind of this preemptive surrender. The thing, um, the thing colors that exactly... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's also the Russians. Um, oh, why does Germany do this? Why does Germany do what? Um, all, mostly medium speed rail? Because um, Germany does have an NBS problem. Uh, unlike, for example, Southern Europe or France. Because German, because high speed rail was not invented here. High speed rail, as we know it, was invented in Japan and reinvented in Europe in France. Germany does not like learning from France. Um, and the sort of... Uh, so Deutsche Bahn internally is pushing for something different. And the sort of people who would be pushing for this on the outside, the more technically literate ones, they're still the German middle class. So what do they look at? They don't look at France, they look down on France. They look at Switzerland, they look at the Netherlands, they look at Austria, which have medium speed based systems. The Netherlands does have one high speed liner, which is a complete white elephant. Um, and, um, th and of course, if you're the Netherlands and you're building a domestic rail network, you don't need high speed, you're a tiny country. Same as if you're Switzerland or even Austria. So in, uh, so in Germany, essentially, we're learning from the wrong people, um, to the extent we learn at all. And, this is, and because the German medium speed rail system works kind of okay, I mean, Deutsche Bahn has a lot of problems, but the ridership is pretty healthy, for example, uh, and growing. Um, because of that, a lot of people talk um, about internal critiques. It's like, I can see a world in which the United States learns from others. Again, the United States is a much more arrogant, much more self-assisted country than is Germany. So it's a much bigger hurdle, matching the fact that the United States is literally the worst in the developed world at this. Um, it's something, in some cases, even in the world. 
Uh, oh, oh. Oh, you mean in Germany? Can the German learn from Spain? Yes, they absolutely can. They just don't want to because that requires... Like, it's kind of like telling Americans your country should be more like Mexico. Like, there's a, a lot... It's, it's not even a randomly selected poor country. It's a country that we are richer than them is such an in, ingrained thing in the psyche. Um... And uh, yeah, so, this, so that is the problem. Whereas, for example, it's, it's, Americans can sometimes cite China favorably. I mean, as an enemy, but as an enemy that's like maybe has maybe has some innovations that are worth learning from. Nobody will ever say that about Mexico. Nobody will ever say, "Huh, Mexico actually has some uh, cool uh, earthquake laws or some or Oino Circula." Like actually, um, the entire American discourse about Oino Circula is negative. Um, and yeah, Oino Circula. Yeah, for Spain is only for four weeks in July or August, exactly. Essentially, yeah. So for here, it's the combo of vacation and uh, uh, it's a combo of vacation and um, the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Like if Spain had grown in the last fifteen years at the same rate as the previous fifteen years, first of all, it would have converged, and second, the Germans would have noticed. Um, oh, the Ringtausch. Um, why does Germany do it? Well, because German, because Olaf Scholz wants to be seen doing the least for Ukraine in order to satisfy people who are not actually important, but who he thinks are important, which is quite a lot like the NIMBYs, if especially Darien. It's preemptive surrender. Darien NIMBYs are not important. I threw a trial balloon for like statewide people in Connecticut. I'm not going to tell you who. Not the government. I don't mean people who I expect to have a good read on statewide politics in, in Connecticut when I, I literally told them that there's going to be some pretty serious impact with Darien. They didn't flinch. I mean, nobody likes Darien. People in other in other exclusively white, exclusively rich suburbs um, mock them as saying Darien rhymes with Aryan. That's how racist Darien is. Like, the other suburbs aren't going to have solidarity with them. Um, this is, by the way, completely by coincidence. I mean, it's just it's a matter of like the curve of this this specific curve of i-95 if this had happened elsewhere this might have been politically harder but it's not um but nobody's even gonna propose that because they're afraid again and, and this is the same with Olaf Scholz he's afraid of the East German SPD people and he's afraid of the Niedersachsen gang the Niedersachsen gang are people who will never vote anything other than SPD um the East Germans might actually um but it's going to be very difficult for them to do so because um, if they defect, they defect to Die Linke, um, which um, is radical enough that it will not just want a rando SPD washout just because that SPD washout was pro-Russian. I mean, yeah, they, they, I mean, Die Linke did invite um, Schroeder to speak at the Bundestag before the war, maybe five years ago, by which point he was already persona non grata in SPD. At most of Espada, but um, the um, but they will not maybe take him as his leader. They hate the, the that meant the, the tendency within Espada. Yeah, they like the tanky bits, but they don't like how neoliberal his economic policy was. So they can't meaningfully de facto de Um Some of the voters can, but not the politicians. And the vo- um, and on net, the politicians are going to move toward Espada because the people, no politicians, the voters are going to move toward Espada because sending equipment um, because helping Ukraine militarily is very popular within Germany. Um, But again, Schultz listens to actors who he thinks are important but aren't. Um, And um, the, so so this is why they, so to to do that, he needs to not necessarily do little, but to be seen doing the least. So he doesn't want to, uh, um, so he doesn't want to send to do anything that other countries didn't do, um, and this is why with uh, when Germany actually did um, agree to send the Leopards to Ukraine and not just to do this um, exchange program with Czechia for Soviet tanks, uh, the um, th- this also required the United States to randomly send thirty American tanks that are very difficult for anyone other than the United States Army to operate. Um. So, so that is the, the situation with Charleston. This is also the analogy with the situation in, in, in a place like Darien. And um, so again, I don't think that the president cares is what makes this politicized. I think the fact that people say, well, you can't do it. Um, 
as um, the entire thing as opposed to the strongest part of the entire thing. That matters. And this is, again, the exact same sort of pettiness happens for medium speed for, for medium speed things. I mean, there, there were NIMBYs who opposed a not even, I mean, a plan to build high speed rail. I mean, you'd expect, oh, they do some high speed bypasses, like doing at least New York, uh, not New York, New Haven, doing New Haven to Kingston, maybe, uh, just because I 95 is much straighter here and the uh, rail route is much less straight. So the benefits of building a bypass are high. But first of all, they didn't do the entire thing. The, the propo- at one point, there was a proposal to do that, to start an old Saybrook just because the old line is less curvy here. And also here, there are a bunch of movable bridges that are difficult to deal with. Um, and even that led to some NIMBYism. Um, and right now, people are talking, and, and right now there is some NIMBYism from this town. Uh, no, not from this town, from this town, Charlestown, about impact in an area of, this is technically within the municipality, but nobody lives there. We're not talking about ramming a line through here, we're talking ramming it through here. Um, and um, so if the top thing to do is going to be something medium speed or something small, the NIMBYs are still going to NIMBY. Uh, and as I said, you know, the NIMBYs, relative to the number of lines, may be the same, but relative to the kind of line, it's not. Um, and um, what else? The... Um, like when I talk about, there are petty actors that are not NIMBYs, just local politicians who extract concessions um, and often use the NIMBYs to their advantage. Well, I can help you with the NIMBYs, but you need to give me X, Y, Z, if you know what I mean. Often they don't even phrase it in that direct way, if you know what I mean is, oh, I've heard you have NIMBY problems. Well, it would be easier to deal with them if you gave me X, Y, Z, if you know what I mean. Um, it's like very mobster type talk because it's not people who, because the people who are saying things are so repulsive there they, and, and they understand how repulsive they are so they never say them out loud they always use circumlocution so I mean, you never say whack this guy or you never or sorry you maybe say whack this guy and even that is a euphemism you don't say kill this guy you say this guy looks like he's gonna get whacked the way he's gonna continue right I mean you, you don't order killing people um it's repulsive, and you know it's repulsive. Um, it's, you have you establish an understanding, and this is going to happen. It, but it's going It happened in the United States when you downgraded subways to light rail. It's happening in the United States. It is downgraded high speed rail to medium speed rail, and it is going to happen in Germany. We're already seeing signs of it. If it downgrades, um, if it downgrades subways to tramways. Again, they have long planning lead times on these tramways just because um, suddenly it's an important line rather than some, like, throwaway, some, some 50 million euro throwaway to a multi-billion euro program. That, uh, people are going to talk about the multi-billion dollar program, not about the 50 million throwaway. Um, so, yeah, of course, like, people are, of course, of course there are going to be multiple layers of review, multiple, uh, um, multiple NGOs that feel like they should be consulted none of them should be consulted. Generally, when someone wants to be consulted, if they're a technical expert, the answer should probably be no, and if they're not, the answer should definitely be no. Um, and, and I've seen good proposals just languish forever just because there were too many cooks in the kitchen, even if the cook, even, even when the cooks were competent and often the, the people we're talking about are not. And so this is why you should not downgrade. Um, if your costs are high, figure how to fight back, how to fight back against the NIMBYs, how to fight back against petty actors. Um, again, the 15 million example for the Marx Brothers playground from the beginning, where it should have been just free. Um, fight against surplus extraction. If you have surplus extraction problems, they will get worse, in fact, if you downgrade, because the downgrade means lower physical cost and lower benefits, but the petty actors are not going to shrink. The petty actors want the same. Now, maybe they, maybe they will get less because they don't want to get take too much relative, but they will take. But it's degressive. They will take more relative to the size of the project. There will be more waste relative to what you're building. Um, be aware 
the solution to, fa to the fact that in Germany things take too long is to reform things so that they will take less long. This means Germany needs to, first of all, understand that there is nothing in the English-speaking world or in the Netherlands that's worth copying. Um, now, I don't think people are talking about bringing in design-build or anything like that. Um, there's only a little bit of PPP shit, um, but you never know. Um, and this does mean that Germany needs to see what local places that build fast do, and this is Spain for all the places, for, 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 not for high-speed rail, but for, in, but for metros, Italy, um, and imitate that. Or even honestly, look at look at Switzerland to some extent. I mean, Switzerland has a lot of nimbyism. Switzerland builds more housing per capita than does Germany. Switzerland also builds more tunnels, more rail tunnels per capita than does Germany. Um, it hyper optimizes everything to minimize tunneling. But when you hyper optimize, you create really good rail service, and people are going to use this really good rail service, and that's going to um, require running more service to the point that you do need to build more tunnels. Um, so the slogan that I like use to, to, to use for this is electronics before concrete, not instead of concrete. Um, so, and it's it's actually a good example of the electronics concrete issue because if you understand electronics before concrete, yeah, the electronics get easier on the way to concrete. If you just uh, if you just rule out concrete, the petty actors will start having opinions about the electronics. I already said this in New York where people who don't know what loading gauges start having opinions about rail signaling or about battery electrification is the latest thing. Um, it's actually a big problem with the regional rail program that we propose at Transit Matters for Boston because we essentially rule out concrete unless you count high platforms as concrete and by all accounts you shouldn't. Um, so we, because we were just not talking about the North-South Rail Link and just talking about electrification, suddenly the consultants who think that they know trains but don't start having opinions about how to do electrification. Um, which is frustrating because Boston is a region that can do small things but not big things because of planning capacity issues. But as soon as you rebrand, I shouldn't say small, but medium-sized thing as big, suddenly all of the politicos, all, um, all of the people who are often negatively selected for competence because the best among the political overclass would have maybe gotten a federal job. And these are people who are not getting federal jobs. Um, I shouldn't say the best. Like, there's a specific political in Boston that get a federal job as a total moron, but um, but this is often what's the case, I should say. Um, so because of the selection issue, and because these people are just often just petty shits who don't know anything, and, are, and yet are in a position of enough power that they expect other people to lower their gaze in their presence, um, so yeah, of course they're going to say things like we're going to leapfrog Europe um, about battery electrification. Like these are so you let these people have opinions about anything, and and you actually listen to these opinions, and things are going to suck. So you remove the incompetent, um, and if you downgrade the project, the incompetent people are still going to be there, and they're still going to have opinions about the highest level project. No, Berlin is not run by such people. Berlin is run by people who um, know that France has commuter trains. They look down on France. They know that France has commuter trains. Uh, and the problem in Berlin, again, it's not people being... It's not technical... It's not, I shouldn't say it's not technical. The people in Boston are not technical. Either. It's not people who are random political appointees with opinions, often, but, but it is often random actually elect the politicians or... Um, political activists who don't really view themselves as mass transit, or if they do, they think of themselves as like uh, urbanist something, community neighborhood something. It's, I, I call them NIMBYs. Technically, it's not NIMBY to be programs, but in practice, all of the people who are program anti-subway in Berlin and also in, for example, Vancouver, that is to say Patrick Condon, are um, raging NIMBYs against having. Um, so, so anyway, this is, what, what, this is like my main point here, is that you can think is, is that if you have a large program and um, and it's seen as a generational program, then it'll just attract petty actors who think it's my once in a working lifetime opportunity to extract money from other people. And then um, you can you should make these people go away, not by paying them off, but by politically eliminating them, or just making sure they don't matter anymore, and. 
and the problem is that um, just downgrading the project or shrinking the project will not make them go away. You reduce your Uban expansion program from a 200 kilometer plan to 165 kilometer plan, they will still have a pain. And, and just to be clear, 165 is very close to 200, but we are in Berlin in 155. So over what's currently in service, it's a big change. Then yeah, they will start having opinions about smaller things. You replace the plans for Uban expansion with the tramway expansion. And yeah, they will start making ridiculous, ridiculous demands to uh, review things further for the tramways as well. And the tramway lead time here is just going to grow, which is already happening. Um, and again, in the United States, the, the, the country lost the ability to build subways sometime in the 70s and 80s. New York, of course, lost the ability to build subways in the 40s um, and 50s, I guess. But in... Um, but that, but the solution, which is to build light rail, just yeah, I worked for a decade where they had good light rail ideas, and then it stopped working. Um, and then after light rail, when when they stopped being able to build light rail, what do they do? They do bus rapid transit, and they can't build that either. I mean, the lines get watered down. It's called BRT creep. They get watered down to the point of ridiculous. To the point that they're so ridiculous that they're worse than normal buses in Berlin. Maybe they get a little bit of dedicated lanes, but only a little, and only when it doesn't matter. Um, maybe they have prepayment, but often not. Maybe they you're, often they just are branded as this is a good bus. It's not like the bus that you see homeless black uh, homeless black people use, and that does nothing. Branding is not that important. Um, and now the new I w you know something? I don't mind that he only has a few, I don't mind that Phil Ang only has a few years of transit experience. I mind that his experience is running the LIRR where he just was not good. I'm not he didn't do anything especially bad, but the LIRR is a bloated, inefficient, um in many ways racist outfit, and he did nothing to change that. Um he was not reform it any he was not a reformer in any way. Uh, his attempt, the only thing he tried to innovate was, innovate, right? was uh, um, battery trains, which is exactly what the MBTA wants. So yeah, I guess they're hiring him to do battery trains. No, just unhire him. Him and Scaramucci. Uh, yeah, Brightline got the, yeah, Brightline is private. And um, the... And didn't have the state as, a, as an obstacle or any big political movement as an obstacle. Whereas note that, for example, Texas Central, first of all, it's private by people who overbuild. Second, the state is not an obstacle, but there is a big political movement of people who view themselves as the Republican base who are an obstacle. LA or R, yeah, they are just terrible people. Um, terrible people who hate the, who, who, who hate the city. Um, yeah, they're bringing that to the MBTA. Failure is being rewarded. Why would people try to succeed when they see Phil Ang get promoted? Um, and this is the only way a person does a good job, get rewarded, is if he somehow becomes a superstar like Andy Byford, which is not available to just boring good people. Um, but anyway, do people have questions? Um, what do you mean overbuilt near streetcar projects? Oh, you mean like in the United States? Yeah, when the, one of the downgrades was instead of doing long light rail lines, they do short ones that are just downtown streetcars that nobody uses because people don't actually need to take public transit for a distance of a kilometer and a half. Am I familiar with research on construction lots of nuclear reactors? Yes. Um, I'm especially impressed by the by how the people who did the uh, comparative work at Breakthrough, showing how the repeating like at scale uh, state built reactors in Korea show that it's possible to build nuclear reactors affordably, and therefore the United States should have further privatization of construction to small uh, to small modular reactors rather than 
um, have st anything state built because essentially they're a right wing outfit trying to sell themselves as environmentalists to people who are not actually environmentalist. I mean, there's some, but not exactly. No, it has nothing to do with civil versus common law. Remember, in the 1970s, Germany, Britain, and Italy built for basically the same cost. Um, the British cost explosion is... I don't want to say it's Thatcher, but it happened at the same time as Thatcher and Major. Yeah, I mean... No, I'm just saying the descriptive um, statistics, right? But yeah, I mean, the, um, the cost exploded. The issue with... Remember... remember in transit, costs don't explode. In transit, some places have cost explosion and some don't. Italy, remember, has lower real construction costs now than in the 1970s. Um, yeah, in general, civil versus common law was something that looked attractive because there is an Anglo premium, but it's an Anglo premium that only goes back about 30 years. Um, and it looks like it's Anglo, it's a civil law premium because most of the countries that learn, because the, the problem is not, are you civil or common law, is do you, learn from, do you learn from Britain? Or are you the United States, which for parallel and uh, for, for parallel reasons also lost its minds, it also lost its mind of minds in different ways. Um, and then is trying to imitate Britain because British are, because they think British accents are posh or something. Um, Canadian construction costs on mass transit are exploding out of control as we speak. Would I ever recommend a light rail to metro conversion? Yes, but it depends on the line. In LA specifically, yes. Um, they should do this to the Expo and Blue Lines to separate them. Um, after the regional connector to essentially make sure that the regional connector can turn them into two independent lines um, rather than two branches of one line where the trunk is partly um, at grave. Um, I don't know enough about other North American cities to do that. In Berlin, I won't call it a metro conversion. Like uh, so, they need. To, so this is a very busy streetcar, and so is this. But I would call it a metro conversion. I would build. I would call it building a, an U-Bahn extension, that happens to, partly parallel the busiest streetcars. If that makes sense. Whereas for a light rail, like whereas the blue line and the, expo line or light rail lines, we're saying specific section. Like sp the, the downtown at Great Segment needs to be buried. Yeah, but the, okay, life extensions are very different. Life ex extensions are very different from building um, a new. Life extensions are essentially you do that until you can build enough solar and wind. Um, whereas building new, at this point, you just build solar and wind. Like, yeah, nuclear power is fun, but the construction costs, even in, let's say, a place like Finland or especially in, even or even in South Korea, they're not worth it. Um, keep just keep them just keep the lights on as soon, uh, for as long as you can so don't be Robert Habeck but like the problem is that it's a construct it's a it's a technology that's really nifty and also at this point there are cheaper things to do there are cheaper ways to do the same thing um um but anyway no in construction costs of infrastructure of like transportation infrastructure Canada is potentially the worst in the atmosphere, other than the United States. Like Toronto, the Ontario line is, I, th I think, has reached a, a billion a kilometer. Um, are there examples of local extortion that I'm aware of? In Italy, there's no local environment. In Italy, um, a lot of um, environmental impact issues, by which I don't just mean air pollution, or endangered species, but even things like architectural impacts, uh, historical impacts, uh, noise, uh, uh, and traffic impacts, all of that is top-down bureaucratic. Um, remember, in Italy, traditionally, the ministers don't last in the, uh, and the, um, civil, and the civil service does. 
it's the opposite of the Netherlands, where uh, Mark Rutte has been the prime minister since the First World War, give or take, and the um, civil servants are rotated between spa- between positions to avoid giving the experts too much power, or to avoid, or rather, avoid letting people become experts. Um, you know, Spain has generally more stable governments, but Spain also has strong civil service in this. Very, uh, in, 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 a lot of uh, engineering prestige, much more so than even in Germany and the Netherlands, let alone the Anglosphere. I would not call the Netherlands a large city. Um... It's a small country, but it's a country. It's not a large city. Um, yeah, um, power. Uh, electricity. Um, I haven't seen anything about water line, about water mains or sewer lines, but I have seen stuff about electricity. Again, nuclear power is big because... Essentially, every nuclear plant is a mega project. There's also a lot of stuff about the non-mega project analog, which is solar and wind, and how there's and how because it's so modular, the construction costs of both are falling very rapidly. Uh, which essentially, at this point, solar and wind is just a matter of how fast can you build them. Uh, it takes off the same. Um, in the United States, I guess there's a problem with transmission and with a bunch of with much stronger NIMBYs who are just morally elite against renewable power, which we have in Germany as well. Bavaria has very little wind power because Bavaria is very NIMBY. Um, and again, morally objects to renewable power because you're supposed to do things specifically to offend the Greens. And there's yes, there is such such, such research. Um, are there other questions? We can make it a two-hour recording. A little longer than a two-hour session. Two-hour recording. What's the... Oh, we have very little land. Or not land, dealing. Really. Right. Um, if there are no further questions, then thank you all for watching, especially with the very last minute announcement. Um, I hope you remember that However attractive it is to downgrade lines when you're facing long lead times or high costs, you should not do that. That's not going to solve the problem. The political problems with high costs are going to happen either way. Um, this is mostly about Germany, but also the United States did that and needs to undo that, if it can, which I don't think it can, without personal changes. But yeah, so thank you all for watching and I will see you again in the next one. So ciao, ciao.